Well, good afternoon, and thank you all for allowing me this opportunity. Um, I am really excited to address you, and the reason why is that I think you all are a very bright crowd, and I speak so often to crowds that I don't think are very bright. <laughs> and I believe that the topic I've chosen to address is one that is almost universally of interest that represents one of the great conflicts we face as a society right now, and I mean uh, intellectually, that it has led to both conflict between right and left, saved and unsaved, and primarily of my interest, even within the so-called right, and even within various camps of Christendom. I refer to the subjects of freedom and virtue, but I said subjects, plural, and I will hope that by the time I am done speaking today, that I will have helped to singularize the concepts of freedom and virtue, by which I mean that one cannot and will not survive without the other, and by which I mean our pursuits, our objectives, our aims ought to be not uh, pointed or facing one at the expense of the other, but rather always and forever in a context of both and. Um, besides my insult at all audiences that are not the New St. Andrews College, I actually um, really do appreciate being here, really do consider it a privilege, and I'm grateful for both the friendships I have in this town and the sense of kingdom co-laboring that I know exists. No matter what anybody feels about the moment in which we are living, I want to promise you I will turn 50 next year, and I was your age about a week ago. <laughs> it's literally, and I think other folks in the room maybe my age might kind of know what I mean. 30 years has gone by very quick. We are facing right now a moment in time that requires us to be together, that requires co-laboring in the kingdom. Any attempt to make the case and live out the case and advance the cause of freedom and virtue divorced from one another is fighting with one hand tied behind our back. I come as a friend, recognizing you all as friends, and want desperately for us to engage this battle ahead in friendship, because I think that most of the time when we feel discouraged in this age, we are discouraged not because of what our enemies are doing, but because of what our friends are doing. And I think that when we stick together in this cause, we remain unstoppable. I wrote a book that came out in late 2021 called There's No Free Lunch, 250 Economic Truths. And the basic idea in the book was to take 250 um, quotes and excerpts and contributions from other scholars, thinkers, luminaries, many of which are deceased, many of which are still living, but uh, attempt to rediscover, adding my own commentary page by page, to what I believe is missing right now in the uh, overall understanding of economics, which, which as he mentioned, it is the issue in which I'm very passionate. I did not call it an extracurricular issue because managing capital as I do in my business, running a national wealth management firm is not separate from the integration of faith and economics. It is the application of faith and economics. This notion that what I do is in a day job go and manage money and then when I have time I come speak at other events about this extra credit topic is absurd. What I do all day is address this topic, the integration of faith and economics. We are unfortunately in need of a refresher, but I think that many people who value what I will call a market economy or free enterprise, and I do know what everybody means when they call it capitalism, but it's not the word I choose to use, and I hope you will not use it as well. I can explain why in Q&A. But when I advocate for something like a market economy or free enterprise, I recognize that a significant portion of the people arguing with me 
that might advocate for some of the same public policy I advocate, might have the same temperament in the socio-political sphere, oftentimes might even share um, some of the same faith commitments, that many times they are doing so for entirely different reasons than I am. And I wanna talk today about the reasons that we advocate for market economy and the issue I was trying to get to in the last book that I wrote, effectively being the real issue at hand about this subject of freedom and virtue, the harmonization, the juxtaposition of these two concepts that are too often separated. I believe we do not merely face a challenge of defending markets against those who don't defend markets, but we face the challenge, the underlying objectives defending liberty and virtue is harmonized. And I base this as a starting presupposition, the very reason why I defend a market economy in the Garden of Eden. I start with the notion that all a market is, is humans acting. And, and if I'm going to understand what a market is and elaborate upon this idea of human action, it does seem to me, before I can truly understand why humans act or how humans act, I should probably understand what a human is. What can I learn about the human person? So it's why many of us, both in Protestant and Catholic traditions, by the way, advocate for an understanding of economics that begins with anthropology, the study of the human person. And I believe that you will find most flawed and errant economic understanding effectively stems from poor anthropology, a poor understanding of the human person. The notion that humans act and that a market just is. And all I mean by this is that you take away, I don't know, let's say that there's 300 people in the room right now. If there's just two of you left, there will be a market. You may not have commerce to do, and you may not need a medium of exchange that we call money, but there will be some sense of need for cooperation. When are you leaving? What time are you going? Where do we need to meet? I'm down to only five bananas. Do you have enough bottled water? Two people on a desert island is always the way to start your understanding of economics. I mean this very seriously. Because there is the thing that God made the world with called scarcity. Scarcity existed in the Garden of Eden, and scarcity existed before sin. In the Garden of Eden, God put mankind into a venue of scarcity and vulnerability. But we interpret the word vulnerability to involve sin, and that was not the case pre-fall. Until sin entered the world in the garden, there was still humans acting. There were still mandates given by the creator to the created. Yet, before he gave them their very first commandment of what they were to do, which I'll, I'll spoil the end for you, was to fill the earth and subdue it, to have dominion over the animals, to cultivate the creation, to basically go be stewards of economic growth. That was really what Genesis 1 said, to be stewards of economic growth. How's that for right-wing radicalism? <laughs> but before that, he said that he made the sun, and the moon, the stars, the land, and the sea. These are pretty big things, beautiful, impressive. And every one of them, day by day by day, was good, good, good. Then he gets to the sixth day, and he makes mankind, and he calls it very good. And we know that there is only one thing in the creation account that is referred to as being an image bearer of God, being made with an elevated dignity, and that is us, human beings. Um, my wife and I have a puppy. My wife loves the puppy. You get what I'm saying here? And... <laughs> No matter how much any of us love our pets, none of us believe that our pets possess the dignity of a human being, or that our pets have the ability to see and comprehend beauty, to be contemplative. There is a certain interiority to the human person that is incredibly unique. Now, there's a lot of things unique about the human person. Our rational faculties, contrary to some people you may meet, are actually rather impressive. The, the human capacity for reason is God created. 
um, pre-fall, by the way. The human capacity for innovation, for productivity, these are all the things that we associate with a market economy. These are all the things that develop civilization. And we are just sitting here surrounded by various elements of the material universe that required something that could not exist apart from, which is both material and immaterial. The material is, of course, the goods, the wood, the brick, the mortar, the pieces. There isn't a single thing in this iPhone that didn't exist in the Garden of Eden. Did you know that? Nothing. So that's not true. They didn't have the various digital technologies and the, uh, and the way in which silicon, of course, was applied over the years, whatnot. But if you think about it, you know what I mean. The parts, the raw materials all existed. And all that has happened since the Garden of Eden, in a process created by God and, in fact, commanded by God, not merely created, was human beings taking the raw materials and adding to the raw materials ideas and ingenuity. Ideas and ingenuity that the mountains, the plants, and the animal kingdom cannot add. And out of this comes their ability to bring truth, beauty, and goodness to the created order and to co-create with God. And this is a term that a lot of times, particularly in, in uh, theologically orthodox uh, communities, can, can quickly give people a pause. But I'm theologically orthodox, and so you don't need to worry. <laughs> but I'm, I mean the language I'm using. And I'm not wrong about this. God did not complete the iPhone, and God created all the material that is needed for the iPhone. And mankind added to God's creation the various elements that resulted in the great works of history, of architecture, of art, of technology, of commerce, of a commercial society. And yet, of course, the key distinction, the one I could go heretical if I wanted to, is that we can't create ex nihilo. We can't create out of nothing. But with that caveat out of the way, there should be no discomfort at all with the notion that God asked us to co-create, to take the potential of creation and add to it and build to it and cultivate and steward, exercise dominion in this great, beautiful world that he's created. And so, by the way, none of this is in my speech at all. I haven't even started. So, <laughs> I just, I, when these glasses are on, I'm looking at the notes, and when I'm looking at you, I'm just sort of riffing. I don't know. <laughs> the, the reason I set it up this way is to understand that I consider the uncomfortability of defending a market economy perverse for Christians who know basic creation theology. Because all I mean is humans acting and who the human is, is an image bearer of God and all people, not the half of us that are in the upper echelons, uh, the top half of income productivity and not the top 20%, top not the 1%, if there is anything in the world that breaks down wealth inequality, income inequality, and class struggle, it's creation. Because here's my belief about the percentage of the population that can and should contribute to market economy. It's every single human being ever created because they were made by God with dignity. So I don't have a materialistic view or a Darwinian view or a Randian view that wants to see some of the real, truly enlightened, capable people excel and then the others live off of that largesse. My advocacy is for everybody to contribute to market economy because they've all created with this thing in common, being image bearers of God, created with dignity, commanded to productivity, creativity, and innovation. All of this is just in the first book of the Bible. We haven't even got outside of Genesis 1 yet. And we go through Genesis 2 and 3, you get to unpack more and more. But of course, what we do know takes place in some of the subsequent chapters is one of the pivotal events in history, the fall. And we know that on the other side of the fall, we enter, for those of us who hold to Orthodox Christian theology, redemption. And I believe now we operate as market actors, much like as the Adam and Eve and what the human race was created to in the garden, we deal with the realities of scarcity, 
right? Market economy, very different if every single thing was equally abundant. It's because it is not. The abundance problem is the inverse of the scarcity problem. It's out of these ideas that post-enlightenment we were able to sort of codify it into concepts of supply and demand. But if they came up with terminology like supply and demand after the Enlightenment, does that mean that supply and demand didn't exist before the Enlightenment? Of course not. And similarly, this idea about a tension with liberty and virtue, these were hardly new concepts. Aristotle was dealing with this very subject of how humans could essentially find some form of happiness and fulfillment and yet serve a common good. This is thousands of years ago, and it was a, a heavy subject in the writings of Augustine. And then when you get into uh, later centuries, St. Thomas Aquinas, I think, became one of the first Catholic scholars to embrace the idea that unlike the Franciscans before him, that a life commitment to poverty was not necessarily a noble thing, that there was room for exercising a certain degree of market activity around prices that didn't contradict principles of justice and fairness and morality. So even more, uh, shall we say, ancient figures, and by ancient figures, I don't mean me at age 50, smart Alex. <laughs> Augustine, Aristotle, Aquinas being the great three examples. But as we get into a little bit more modern understanding of, of economics and where this subject really started to advance, and by the way, when economic growth started to go like this, is the um, Scottish Enlightenment but uh, influenced, but nevertheless extraordinary moral philosopher Adam Smith, who, who first brought to bring to bear this notion that in fact, out of a degree of self-interest, of rational um, advancement, of having our needs met, that we necessarily have to meet the needs of others. This is, at the basic uh, level, what we mean by a market economy, that I do not have a way of uh, meeting my needs without meeting others' needs. And I also, by the way, we learned from another classical economist, a contemporary of Smith from a different geography, named Jean-Baptiste Say out of France. This is back when France had some good people that... <laughs> Pretty much kidding. <laughs> that production was the sin qua non, the, the beginning, uh, the alpha of economic activity that I cannot consume unless I first produce and I also cannot consume unless someone else first produces. I must produce so I have the means to consume and someone else must have produced something for me to consume. And these became ideas that Plato and Aristotle, I think, lacked in a sort of pre-modern sense, the sophistication to unpack. But the moral tensions for a couple thousand years were still there between liberty and virtue, between freedom and morality. But ultimately, where we got out of the classical school of economics was an incredible advancement around these concepts of laissez-faire, that you leave humans alone to interact. I believe this starts at the garden, that we essentially were created to work together, to be creative together, to innovate. And of course, what we have found, and again, this I don't want to overdo the theology here, but this is incredibly incarnational, that fundamentally, we are dealing with the, um, there, there is a all at once individual and social component to how God created us. First of all, it exists within the triune God, three persons in one, but in the very purpose of why he made mankind, he immediately said to Adam, you have no prayer on your own. You are going to be very lonely. And I'm gonna make a helpmate suitable for you. And that out of the communities that were to be, um, both pre-fall and post-fall, that an individual made with dignity, they did not get their dignity as a byproduct of their association with each other. By being a member of a church, by being a member of a nation, by being a member of a community, by being any part of a collective, their image bearing status was individual. And this is the individualism 
of an incarnate Christian theology that is wed miraculously and beautifully to a uh, understanding that we are one and many, that we interact with one another. There's a family unit and, uh, uh, of course, through the population growth over the years, a, um, a need for broader social interaction. And so I believe that the testimony of history has been that a market economy facilitates this other element of how God created us and what I refer to is the social dynamic and the need for social cooperation. We're now on the other side of fall. There is violence, there's greed, there's selfishness. There's all of these things that can be somewhat uncivilizing. And yet, in a market economy, our needs are more met by meeting other needs. And it creates an imperfect, fallible, but more or less best available option for social cooperation. And Adam Smith was the first to essentially point out that in this sort of understanding of self-interest, that great uh, advancement could take place. But really the profundity of Adam Smith's 1776 book, The Wealth of Nations, was not merely applying that. Uh, even his famous line about how the butcher and the baker, uh, that really people um, get what they're after in life in sense of they're, they're trying to provide for their family, but they have to go provide needs for others. There's a microeconomic component, but what the Wealth of Nations was really about was the macroeconomic ramification of that, that whole nations see greater wealth when whole nations cooperate and trade with one another. And so a subsequent classical economist, David Ricardo, introduced the law of comparative advantage. There are nations that have natural resources that other nations do not have. And their ability to play to their own strengths and have this free exchange, a byproduct of human action created in the garden, brought forward a couple hundred years in the aftermath of the enlightenment, all of a sudden you got hockey stick growth. But you didn't get hockey stick growth because of the ideas of Smith, Say, and Ricardo. It was a necessary but not sufficient condition of the incredibly blessed times we live in. The times that we live in are a byproduct of not only these concepts in economics that we consider the classical school, but it was wedding them to some degree of freedom. That if you take these great ideas of a division of labor, uh, that mankind can do great things when they pursue their own passions and skills and interests, allowing for specialization in the workforce. These are all, one way or the other, birthright of Adam Smith. But if you connect it to a world in which there is no freedom, it cannot breathe, it cannot marinate, and it cannot ultimately fertilize. And so the great miracle of the American experiment was taking many of these ideas about economic liberty and attaching it to a framework of religious and civic liberty. And more or less in economic history, what resulted in the Industrial Revolution were concepts that came about because of the miracles uh, unleashed out of classical economics, but that they were able to fertilize in a period of freedom. And the ancient, debates and battles and tensions about freedom and virtue continue. We're still living in a fallen world. Along comes Karl Marx to clean all of this up for us once and for all. Thank you, it went very well. <laughs> but Marxism and particularly, um, if, you, if you want to kind of take the lens back a little bit, you're talking about a significant amount of German intellectuals in the second half of the 19th century that more or less framed an econo a competing economic view to the laissez-faire of Adam Smith to a moral framework around class struggle and around the struggle of the proletariat. Uh, the notion that capital and labor are stuck in an eternal uh, wrestling match, and that it is a moral struggle. The mankind is at war with nature. It was rooted in deeply flawed theology. It was root, rooted in deeply flawed philosophy, but it was nevertheless an extremely um, and very intentional moral argument. 
in a lot of ways, um, clarity was brought about by the debacle the 20th century communism was, the, the bloodshed of uh, totalitarian communism did not cause a lot of people to warm up to the idea that uh, uh, shared means of production, an abolition of private property, that some of the key cornerstones of, of communist economic distinctives were working very well. And, and so what really took place in American economic life where there was, entering the 20th century, a general regard for uh, market principles, a general regard for some sort of Tocquevillian sympathies, high value of family, high value of church, high value of community. This is not to say that it was universally orthodox and, and universally sanctified, but, but essentially the, the pre predominant themes in society, right? However, um, the Great Depression called into question not the morality of markets, which at that point the world was still rather turned against what they had seen out of Leninism, but the efficiency of markets. And along comes a gentleman named John Maynard Keynes, a British economist, to say, but wait, there's a third option, central planning. And here he's not advocating for the state controlling the means of productions, you know, maybe on the edges a little bit, on the periphery. But more or less, what Keynes wanted was for the smart guys to turn some knobs, a degree of higher government intervention. It's removed from a moral argument. It's an efficiency argument. The Christians aren't making a moral argument. The market economy advocates giants, legends, people whose shoulders I stand on, Friedrich Hayek, Ludwig von Mises, shortly thereafter, Milton Friedman. They fought Keynes on the efficiency argument, but weren't in a position to make the moral argument because they couldn't start at the Garden of Eden. The anthropology wasn't there. And all at once, a two-headed monster became the enemy of a market economy, a free enterprise, both a moral vacuum and an efficiency opposition, and no moral foundation was forthcoming from the good guys. And in the meantime, markets, being what they were, were just plain doing well. So no one feels a need to alter the playbook, no need to run a pass play when the running plays were working so well. So we get into uh, post-war prosperity. You follow me? And there isn't a great moral divide. Most of the great advocates at this point of a market economy are secular rationalists, totally divorced from any sense of anthropology, theology of the human person, um, the very notion of holding in harmony, freedom and virtue is a sideshow. And the great debate is to what extent we actually want and don't want central planning. And yet we enter a period in which it was almost a non-debate because communism fell for, to a large degree, the Cold War was won, the Berlin Wall comes down, and the overall quality of life, the standard of living in post-war America, up and down income deciles, all advanced. And what you will find throughout history is, is incredibly rare for people of lesser means to complain about the gap between people of lesser means and higher means when the people of lesser means are seeing their quality of life advance. It is when one station stands still and another station is still advancing that all of a sudden the focus becomes on the gap between the two. But when everybody's station is improving, there's a general sense, uh, consensus, if you will, around that status quo. My belief is that that status quo numbed us in a dangerous way because all of a sudden, out of this prosperity of post-war America, out of the intensified prosperity of 80s and 90s, the late 19th century industrial revolution became a late 20th century digital revolution. And yet, going into the 2008 financial crisis, you couldn't find a Christian who could defend a market on basis of human person, theology, anthropology, and 
those secular rationalists that were still fighting over what degree of central planning we needed and didn't need on efficiency were wholly unprepared for then the existential question of, wait a second, how did the 2008 financial crisis happen if markets are so efficient? And the real answers were totally unavailable to those who lacked that foundation, that worldview, those necessary epistemological assumptions to first of all point out that this market economy supposedly, supposedly to blame was not at all a market economy, but a byproduct of heavy interventions of central planning itself, but also fundamentally that what people considered to be a brokenness in the efficiency of a market was not that at all, but a brokenness in the virtue of our society. That ultimately, the indictment out of 2008 should have been in the morality of the person in the mirror, not the framework for economic living that was blamed. I think that what has opened up over the 15 years since the financial crisis is a multi-generational opportunity to reassert what had been missing beforehand, which is a defense of a market economy rooted in proper theology, rooted in a coherent philosophy that defends all at once the need for freedom in transaction, freedom in humans acting, that does not view the state as a beneficial uh, intervener in the way in which people transact, that, that views both profit and loss as helpful things in the advancement of the cause of human flourishing. And at the same time, recognizes that if, all I, if I'm right about what a market is, it's just two humans acting, and they get very complicated because of the, uh, the plurality of humans involved and the speed at which transactions take place. A market economy has been so incredibly efficient that it's enabled us to not even know its market forces playing out. We're able to take all sorts of things for granted all the time. And we can only take them for granted because of a market economy. But my belief is that in the midst of this basic garden definition of markets that we understand based on the doctrine of the fall, the doctrine of original sin, that there is an extraordinary need for markets to be cultivated through the virtue of the people engaging in the market, that we must effectively uh, demand a morality, a character, a sense of community, a quest for that common good that Aristotle wrote about so long ago. And right now, the debate has become the tension between freedom and virtue, holding these two things at odds with one another, that we must sacrifice some degree of virtue to generate virtue, uh, sacrifice some degree of freedom to generate virtue, or that the very pursuit of greater market activity, humans acting, cultivating, growing, innovating, producing, that it itself is corrosive to virtue. And all of these mistakes are avoidable by anybody with a basic understanding of Christian theology a basic understanding of what we were created for, the conditions in which God created us, and the basic cycle of history from creation to fall to redemption. And that in our market activities, we redeem to God what it is he created. And what he created is an incredible opportunity of dignified human beings that are image bearers and co-creators with him that are to bring about these great, incredible, impressive results throughout history and do so in a redemptive context. We will not survive this fight if we believe we have to throw one out for the sake of the other. Now, I don't merely say that because I want to hold on to both. I do, but I will take it a step further. I not only do not believe that it isn't necessary to sacrifice freedom to get virtue, I or nor do I believe, by the way, that freedom has to go away if you're going to have um, 
uh, liberty, that virtue gets sacrificed for the sake of liberty, this sort of libertinism that is often associated with a high regard for, for freedom. I basically will say that in the economic dimension that you have no chance of generationally preserving one without the other, that the testimony of history is abundantly clear. A non-virtuous society, a society that does not demonstrate and reaffirm ongoing acts of character, morality, will inevitably lead to a less free society. And that the messianic nature of the state is such that people, not only will the state take a greater role, the people will beg the state to take a greater role. And if they first come to regulate your transactions, start your watch, and a minute later find out how they take your religious freedom. You have no chance of preserving one category of freedom when you sacrifice another. So to me, the battle for liberty and virtue is not merely an intellectual civil war amongst the right right now. It is the cause of our day that the various things that are often attributed to culture war issues really stem from an inability of the church over the course of a miraculous period of post-enlightenment classical economic wisdom to ever do the truly uh, foundational and ontological work of rooting a coherent economic worldview in the doctrines of scripture. To that end, I work, I join you, I hope you will join me in that cause. Thank you very much. Okay, so we're going to Q&A with our remaining time, and I, I believe there's a microphone somewhere that will go around, and um, I, I will tell you my rules of engagement for Q&A. You do not have to ask me a question on what I just spoke about. You may ask me a question on what I just spoke about, but you also may ask me a question on anything else. You're not gonna stump me. <laughs> I'm just kidding, you might. <laughs> yes? This is a question about something else. Uh, do you believe that tariffs have any role in a free market economy? And if so, what role do they have? Um, the question is whether or not I believe that tariffs, which is essentially, in this case, you do mean an import tariff, correct? You, ba you, you don't merely mean tariff as synonymous with tax, but specifically a tax on a good coming in wholesale to our country to then be resold retail. Is that correct? Because there isn't generally a lot of controversy about tariffs in general, but it's about this idea of protective tariffs. So taxing imports for the purpose of benefiting American manufacturers. Now I'm poisoning the well a little bit here, but so I wanna be fair, but is that, I just wanna make sure that's more or less your, your question, correct? Yeah. Um, so the answer is that for anything I believe about taxes, I have to start with a presupposition. I got that from somebody. I don't know where it came from. <laughs> and my presupposition here is that I believe we need taxation. I believe there will be taxation. I believe there will be some forms of taxation that are more acceptable than others. And I want to be able to answer a question as we, to try to get to the point of what is the least um, burdensome and most efficient uh, form of taxation to meet the cost of government without doing, um, and doing the least amount of harm. And so I start with this presupposition that there's no free lunch. And that was the title of the book, which was an essay Milton Friedman had wrote, and it had become sort of a 20th century euphemism for the law of trade-offs. That because the world was made with scarcity, that's the only reason there's no free lunch, that's the only reason there's such thing as trade-offs, in order for one person to get something they want, they have to get rid of something else they want. And we all do this sometimes millions of times a day. All of our lives amount to a certain degree of trade-off. That if we could both have our coffee and our four bucks, we would love to do it, but we're willing to give up our four bucks to get our coffee. Or at a Starbucks in Manhattan, 17 bucks. <laughs> and so the notion of a tariff fits into this law of trade-offs that whether or not I believe it's an acceptable form of tax in a market economy, I start off with the belief that it is at best case a necessary evil. 
So that maybe the income tax is a good idea, maybe a protective tariff is a good idea, maybe a property tax is a good idea, we're gonna to get to all that, but that all of them do something I don't really love, which is remove money from its most rational and efficient and productive use, which is humans acting, and move it to the hands of disinterested third parties that lack the incentive and lack the knowledge to optimally allocate those resources. But I'm not an anarchist. I'm not even a libertarian for that matter. So I do believe in a cost of government, but I accept that there is a cost to it. Then the question becomes, okay, once you accept that whether it's a tariff or income or property or what have you, once you accept that there, you want it to be as little as possible because you are removing money from its most productive use into a less productive use, what is the best way to go about doing it? And so is it prima facie a tariff an acceptable part of a market economy? Well, we already know it is. It's in the Constitution. Alexander Hamilton wrote about tariffs. I don't think they were meant to be as uh, protective or cronyist in Hamilton's world as they're intended to be now. But in theory, at a high level, I think that they belong in the conversation. But then at a more practical level, so I've gone from the philosophical to the historical to now the most uh, contemporary practical, do I think that a tariff is generally a good idea when it's being done to benefit one at the sake of another, and effectively an American producer versus an American consumer? That's what the tension is. And my answer is more or less I'm pretty much opposed to it. So because I have the lights in my eyes, I can't see all the hands, and I'm going to let the microphone, and plus he'll know who to call on here. Yeah. I was hoping you'd let unrelated questions. Um, so. Tell, tell me your name so I can be polite. Judah. <laughs> okay. Um, more, this is more of an investment question. So as we are, you know, lower risk actors, we're, we're younger, and so we have uh, plenty of time, what would you recommend if we're looking into uh, you know, starting some long-term investment? What area of the economy is there an area of the economy you're invested in? Um, what would you recommend? So just at a very high level, the like universal answer is that everybody's answer to this question ought to be somewhat different. If everyone in the room shares, let's say you're all 21 years old, that's one common input, but various emergency reserves, liquidity, earnings potential, objectives, tax treatment, their family dynamics, there's all sorts of variables that should not lend themselves to a universal answer. But nevertheless, as a general principle for one who just assuming that there's you know, some sort of disposable income above and beyond reserves, the debt's been dealt with, one has kind of got a various rudimentary game plan for the young adult phase of their life underway, and they're looking for some investment that will be long-term compounding of capital, and they don't have the sophistication or liquidity yet for investing in illiquid real estate and all the other types of deals that me and my clients do just to kind of get started, right? With some four-figure, five-figure type amount of money then I have built my career around the belief in dividend growth investments. I have a book called The Case for Dividend Growth, Investing in a Post-Crisis World. I'm happy to send to you that, but more or less, uh, I think you can do very cheap, very inexpensively, uh, and have plenty of liquidity and flexibility to generate a long-term compounding of capital around companies that are growing their free cash flow and growing the portion of it they're paying to you. And I believe most other forms of index investing are more or less uh, momentum chasing and speculative dividend growth investing is more fundamental and better captures the human action envisioned in Genesis 1. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you for speaking with us, Mr. Bonson. My name is Caleb. My question is about the main premise of your talk. You seem to say that there are, there are two main aspects of Christian theology that inform our, our supportive markets, and one being that humans are able to co-create with God, and the second being that we have human dignity. My question is, is The first being that humans what? Co-create with God. Okay, okay. Yeah, the second being that we all have the same amount of human dignity. Mm -hmm. um, and my question is, is it possible to have a coherent secular framework that acknowledges that all humans are equal and that all humans have the ability to create something new out of resources that are already there and support the free market without using Christianity? 
No, it's such a good question. And it's, in a lot of ways, like I, my late father was what was known as a Christian presuppositionalist. And he popularized in, in a sense this notion of what we refer to as the transcendental proof of the existence of God, that fundamentally there is no basis for logic, science, morality, um, apart from a Christian worldview. And he, and he applied that to the field of apologetics, defense of the faith. And, and, and when I view the epistemological upbringing I have from my dad, I look to do so in the field of economics. And I'm well aware of the fact that unbelievers, as my dad was in the apologetical sphere, unbelievers say incredibly intelligent things all the time. And they do incredibly miraculous things in a surgery room all the time. And they can be incredible wealth creators all the time. So this is not remotely contradictory to what I'm saying when I tell you that the only reason they're doing it is because of the truths that you and I believe that they don't. In other words, I'm just stealing from my dad here. They have to borrow from my worldview. So I absolutely believe they can have a coherent worldview, a coherent framework, I should say, a coherent framework for being economic actors. They were made with rationality. I'm a big antithesis guy. However, they were made with the same rationality and reason and, by the way, commandment for productivity, innovation. Sometimes they live it out a lot better than we do. So I don't think it's incoherent, but I don't think it can exist without them climbing up the ladder that requires Christian foundational truth. Okay. That's a great question. Um, what are your thoughts on the Austrian School of Economics and its consistency with what Christians should believe or what scripture teaches about the free market? It's a wonderful question, and it's something I've devoted a significant part of my adult life study to. In a lot of ways, I consider myself a sort of recovering Austrian. I grew up learning economics under uh, von Mises and, and, and Hayek. I, I, there's certain well-known 20th century economists that are in the Austrian school that I hold in very, very low regard intellectually. But the Karl Menger in the late 19th century introducing the subjective theory of value, you, you heard how the affections I have for Adam Smith are really hard to top. But Adam Smith held to one of the worst things that enabled Marx to get hold, which was a labor theory of value. That essentially the value of something is the amount of labor that was imputed into it. That gave Marx a lot of leverage in holding to a struggle between labor and capital, and it was a fatal flaw in Smithian economics. Karl Menger was the original Austrian who came and told us, no, that the value in a market economy is effectively subjective to the consumer, and it is reflected in prices. And that led to Hayekian idea, which is real, true Austrian economics about price discovery. I think that they more or less, when we're really talking about economic theory, got an awful lot right about what uh, Mises called the praxeology, the logic of human action. I consider myself Austrian in that sense, but I do not believe that some of the Austrians' theory of money and credit is entirely true. I think applying the law of marginal utility to money was a brilliant idea, it's distinctly Austrian. But I think the way in which it was applied proved to be extremely foolish. And so now it's a little bit difficult because like it happens so much in, in Christian circles, for example, there's been so many civil wars within Austrian economics that sometimes people don't know what they're referring to. The George Mason University is well known, there's a, a Miesian group out of Auburn, there's these different kind of factions of it. But intellectually, the Karl Mengers, Ludwig von Mises, Friedrich Hayek, these are giants, champions. But their fatal flaw was their secular rationalism. That to me is where Christians have to stand taller, is not in any way forfeiting the wonderful issues by which they were right, but applying a better uh, explanation as to why their theories are true. So I think the Austrians in that sense, much like the monetarist, much like the supply side movement, uh, it kind of comes down to this other gentleman's question in a lot of ways. There's an awful lot of things in economics and much of Austrianism fits into this that are examples of people getting the right conclusions from the wrong premises. 
But I know at the next 2008, if you don't have the right premises and right conclusions, we lose, they win. And that to me is what the challenge is I plan to dedicate the rest of my life to. Thank you, thank you all.